Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. This is a special occasion for us in the Graduate School of Education here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, each year, we have a special lecture uh, in honor of Connie Clayton, who is a very effective, much loved, and revered superintendent of schools here in Philadelphia. And uh, in honor of Connie and all that she's done, a former dean, in his infinite wisdom, not me, uh, thought, well, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, let that name go on through this lecture series and also through a chaired professorship, which uh, a former dean had the brilliance and insight to give to Diana Slaughter. The foe, he's going to be speaking in just a minute. So, we honor Connie in two ways, through this distinguished chair professorship and also through this uh, lectureship, which is an annual event. So I know that Diana is going to introduce our speaker. I, I had an opportunity to speak with him for a few minutes, and I'm very much looking forward to his remarks. He, he's, a, he's a celebrated scholar, and I can tell just uh, from my two or three meetings with him now that he's also warm and genuine human being, and so I welcome you as well and turn it over to my colleague, Diane. Um, I want to um, start off by thanking uh, the uh, Graduate School of Education and two deans, uh, Dr. Susan Furman and Andrew Porter, for their support of the uh, Clayton Lecture Series. And I would also like to thank faculty, staff, and students who have contributed to make this series the success that it has been. Uh, this year in particular, I want to especially thank both uh, Crystal Anderson, who is out right now uh, working on the uh, post-lecture reception meal uh, for us, and Charles Washington, who has, uh, uh, I don't know, filmed I don't know how many of these. Uh, series, and I thank you uh, both uh, for helping to make this happen in 2010. Uh, my own field, as most of you know, is developmental and clinical child psychology, but um, for many years I have been interested in contextual influences upon the development and learning of African American children. And so I have therefore taken a special interest in Dr. B.P. Franklin's work, particularly the historical perspective he lends to the study of the experiences of African American children and their families with schools. Therefore, it is surely my honor to introduce Dr. Franklin as the culminating speaker in the 13-year-long Constance E. Clayton Lecture Series. Dr. Franklin's scholarship as it pertains to the history of African American education has been exemplary. Uh, this has been a key research and writing area since he completed his doctoral thesis on the education of black Philadelphia the Social and Educational History of a Minority Community, 1900 to 1950, which was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 1979. Dr. Franklin is a native Philadelphian, and the focus of his research was highly appropriate for many reasons, including the fact that this city itself is rich in African American history. Uh, today, Dr. Franklin is just as productive a scholar as he's ever been, for example, in his editorship of the Journal of African American History, he has brought a new standard of quality and engagement to the publication. In fact, when I learned that he would be the new editor, I immediately took out a lifetime membership in the organization <laughs> because I took new pride in the organization's ability to make quality decisions. Even a casual examination of his vita indicates that he has been a contributing, productive, and serious scholar of African American life and culture for over a quarter century, engaging students at many different colleges and universities, both here in the U.S. and abroad. And so, uh, without further ado, because the brochure is here and available for additional information about our lecture, I turn this event over to uh, Dr. B.P. Franklin.
I'm really, really very happy to be back in Philadelphia, my hometown. I love Philadelphia. I love getting here as often as I can. I was uh, lured away to New York City briefly uh, for a while, and, and uh, that allowed me to get back and forth on a regular basis. And I continue to come back on a regular basis because all of my, uh, most of my family and so many of my friends are here in Philadelphia, and I'm really, really happy uh, to be here. Uh, as um, Diana mentioned, and I want to thank Diana. This has been a wonderful lecture series. When I was here in Philadelphia, and I taught at Drexel uh, for 10 years, and when I was here in Philadelphia, I attended these uh, Constance Clayton lectures, uh, annual lectures, and they were really, really very, very important. And so I uh, salute her for her uh, stamina, for her intelligence, for her, her, her selectivity. <laughs> and so I'm really, really happy that, uh, and honored, I'm really very honored uh, that she asked me to, uh, to give my thoughts on uh, urban education uh, at this particular point in time. Uh, at, for the last nine years, I have also served as editor of the Journal of African American History. And that is published by the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. The uh, Journal of African American History of, is, I'm, I'm working on volume 95. So, so it started in 1916 and by Carter G. Woodson and continues up until the day. And uh, we just had our annual convention in Raleigh, North Carolina. I just so I came, came into Philadelphia from Raleigh. We were there for a week, and, and Diana was there, and June, Dr. June Patton and Mary Beth Gassman, they were all in Raleigh at the Asala Convention. And, I, and I've been... I've been the editor for uh, nine years, and it's been a lot of work. When I tell people that I have to edit this quarterly journal, you know, comes out every three months, that it's like having two full-time jobs. <laughs> I have to teach the university in, in two departments. I'm in the history department and in the graduate school of education and have my own students, and then have to get out a quarterly journal. But it has been... It's been a really, uh, as, as, as they keep telling me when I start complaining about the amount of work, <laughs> they keep telling me it's a labor of love. It's a labor of love. They really couldn't pay someone enough to do all of this work. And I, and it's, um, and I, and I think it's important work. And, um, and over the last uh, year, for example, I have been sort of pushing the idea that, um, this idea about um, the need to do something about our schools, the need to, to find alternative ways to try to come up with the funding to improve the schools, to make the schools more, the urban schools more, uh, uh, more um, engaging, more uh, relevant, uh, more effective in dealing with our children, particularly African American children. Uh, and so I use the journal uh, as my forum to get out these ideas, to try to generate uh, new ideas and thoughts about how to deal with the problems that are facing uh, urban public schools. Um, the, the, and I brought the journal. I brought copies of the journal here, and I, I distributed, uh, I distributed uh, uh, application forms for the ASALA, and with the, app, with the membership in ASALA, you receive uh, copies of the Journal of African American History. So, so you've got an application, you should come, out, come up at the end and take a look at the past journals, and if you're so inclined, I hope that you will take out a, a membership and you will receive, uh, receive copies. Upcoming issues, I'm putting I'm putting the finishing touches on a special issue devoted to the history of black print culture. In the winter 2011 issue, I'm working on a special symposium devoted to Reverend Leon Sullivan. The, the uh, spring issue will have a symposium devoted to the historian, the very phenomenal historian, Gerald, Gerald Horn. We have a special issue coming up on African Americans and the history of sport. 
And the, main, the topic on which I'm going to be discussing is also coming up in a special issue of the journal on African Americans and movements for reparations. And that's been my sort of my thrust, my pu push over the last uh, couple years, that is to, to, to try to provide some kind of a historical documentation for those demands that African Americans be receive reparations for, not just for slavery, but for the oppression, for the loss of land, for the racial violence that was launched against African Americans during the era of Jim Crow as well. And, but you also have a situation that are occurring now in, in the public schools and in the prisons where people are lobbying politicians and others in order to make sure that the prisons are filled and that more and more African Americans go to prison. So some people are benefiting by placing more and more of our children in prisons. And we need to figure out a way to stop that and to punish those people who are benefiting from our children being placed, more and more of our children being placed in these prisons. And so I was, when I was at Asala, uh, several, I was telling people about this lecture and I gave them the title, it says, a, a freedom that feels like love. A freedom that feels like love. But then the subtitle was reparations, uh, the testing industry, and the promise of freedom schooling. And they said, wow, that's, <laughs> that seems like a strange combination. And, uh, and I hope that I can sort of pull, pull all of that together uh, today uh, in, this, in this lecture. Uh, in Down on the Cross, a letter from a region of my mind, included in the fire next time, uh, published in 19, 19, 1963, novelist and social critic James Baldwin was highly critical of the practice of Christianity that he witnessed in black and white churches. Quote, it is not too much to say that whoever wishes to become truly moral human being must first devote himself or herself, divorce himself or herself from the prohibitions, the crimes, the hypocrisies of the Christian church. If the concept of God has any validity or any use, it can only be to make us larger, freer, more loving. If God cannot do this, then it is time we got rid of him, unquote. In the small black church he preached in as a child preacher, Baldwin found that, quote, the passion with which we loved the Lord was the measure of how deeply we feared and distrusted and in the end hated almost all strangers, unquote. However, Baldwin also pointed out that by, among, them, among themselves, church picnics, dinners, and other events, they held, and he quote, we witnessed their zest for life based on their shared experiences of oppression. Perhaps we're all of us, pimps, whores, racketeers, church members, and children, bound together by the nature of our oppression, the specific and, co and complex risk we had to run. If so, within these limits, we achieved with each other a freedom that feels like love." Unquote. Over the last 30 years, uh, in really in December of 1978, Ronald Batchelor, who has now passed away, and I uh, published an article this is in December of 1978. We published an article in Teachers College Record and it was called Freedom Schooling, a new approach to federal local cooperation in public education. And just to give you an indication of how uh, this, this article, this article was introduced by Mary Frances Berry. Mary Frances Berry wrote the introduction to this article and at the time, she was the Assistant Secretary of Education. She was the E in HEW. And she wrote the introduction to this article called Freedom Schooling that was published in Teachers College Record in December 1978. 
Having witnessed the high rates of academic failure in traditional public schools and having participated in highly successful and innovative programs created in urban magnet schools, we called for freedom schooling, which was to be, quote, a new relationship or partnership between the federal government and local school districts to introduce alternative educational programs, practices, and structures into American public elementary and secondary education. The federal government would evaluate alternative programs and institutions and provide financial assistance to public school systems actively involved in providing successful alternative education, unquote. In that 1978 article, we discussed the origins of the Freedom Schools, from which we took the name. Freedom Schools, of course, were open in various parts of the South uh, during the Civil War and afterwards to provide training and basic literacy skills for formerly enslaved African Americans, uh, children, and adults. The Freedom Schools were sponsored by Northern religious and benevolent societies. The federal government's Freedmen's Bureau opened freedom schools, and African Americans themselves opened many schools throughout the South. Okay, so that was the original freedom schools. But then, of course, you had Freedom Summer, and you had the opening of the freedom schools that the civil rights, uh, civil rights wor uh, workers and volunteers in 1964 in Mississippi, and they opened the freedom schools there uh, for, for black children who were deprived of educational opportunities uh, in Mississippi. The freedom, during Freedom Summer, as you know, you had the volunteers came to the, the black and white volunteers came to the South and they worked in two areas. They worked on voter registration campaigns in Mississippi and then they opened and then they worked in the Freedom Schools with the students, uh, the, it's the students in Mississippi. And then also in the late 1960s, you had John Churchville who opened the Freedom Library School here in Philadelphia. And that was an alternative, Afrocentric, uh, uh, alternative school that uh, was aimed at increasing the academic achievement level of African American children by emphasizing their culture, their heritage in Africa and in the United States. And then also in Philadelphia, you had another alternative school opened, by, opened in, uh, called the Father Washington High School that was in North Philadelphia. That was an alternative school named after Father Washington. And that was, a, that was one of these uh, type of freedom school in the, 19, in the in late 1970s and early 1980s. And Ernest Batchelor, who is the brother of Ronald Batchelor, who was my co-author of the Freedom Schooling article, Ernest Batchelor was the principal of Father Washington High School in North Philadelphia. And Father Washington's uh, high school was, de was devoted to social justice issues, to community development, community education. In the late 1970s, school districts under court orders to desegregate or voluntarily, uh, or were voluntarily pursuing school desegregation, but not interested in forced busing, turned to the opening of the magnet schools to promote desegregation. The purpose of the magnets were to attract white students back into predominantly black and minority public school districts. In the 1970s, the Office of Education, through appropriation through Title VII, made funds available for the opening of magnet schools. And there were hundreds and thousands of magnet schools open throughout the United States, here in Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Cincinnati, Denver, Houston, and various other cities. As a, the, as a result, magnet schools open and they specialize in various areas. You, you know the magnet schools that you had performing arts magnet schools, you had, mu you had music, you had science and technology, foreign languages, agricultural science, sports and athletics, engineering and technology, and any number of areas for these magnet schools. On the basis of what we witnessed and what was reported about these magnet schools, we concluded that the specialized and innovative content associated with the magnet schools increased the motivation, increased the level of motivation of the students attending the schools. In other words, the students in the magnet schools were engaged. They were engaged by the content, by the material, by, by what, the, what the, the, the specialized learning field of knowledge the ex expertise of the teachers involved in these uh, magnet schools. 
And so the, the, so the, so we were advocates, so therefore what we were advocating was that the freedom schools would be, would be similar to the magnet schools, only they would not necessarily be only for school desegregation. Because remember, the reason if you, in order to get money to open a magnet school, it had to be for the purposes of, purposes of school desegregation. But what we were saying is that no, you could have freedom schools and they have this wonderful content, the students are engaged, they're, they're interested, the academic achievement level, but we should, you should have freedom schools and make those available to children in order to, in, in order to keep them engaged and also to improve their academic achievement levels. Uh, in that Freedom School article, we emphasize arts education. Arts education has, you know, was under attack at that time in terms of being, uh, being cut from school curriculum. Ronald Batchelor's uh, doctorate at Teachers College was in, in the field of arts education. And we emphasize that the Freedom Arts School, and, and, and so all, what you have to think about in terms of what we were, what we were visualizing here was a, was a kind of performing art school or a visual art school. And the one that was the most famous and, and well known at that time was of course the school that was, that was um, uh, the subject of the TV series Fame. Remember Fame, the TV series Fame, and it was a performing arts high school, et cetera. So this, remember, we talked about 30 years ago. So, so but Fame was, the, was, was like a model for the kind of arts, performing arts magnet school that we were recommending that people fund. All right, now, over the last, so that was 1978, <laughs> okay? Over the last 30 years, there's been much continuity and some changing regarding freedom schooling, magnet schools, arts education, and problems of achievement for minority students in urban public schools. For example, the Children's Defense Fund, the Children's Defense Fund, founded by Marion Wright Edelman, they have freedom schools. If you go on the, Ch on the Children's Defense Fund website, they have what they call the Freedom Schools Program, which they started in 1995. The Children's Defense Fund Freedom School Program employs college students to facilitate a six-week summer program using an integrated reading curriculum. These servant, and I'm quoting from the Children's Defense Fund, these servant leader interns help children and youth ages 5 to 18 understand through weekly themes and books in, um, in their integrated reading curriculum that they can make a difference in people's lives. They can make a difference for themselves, for their family, for their community, for the country, and the world through hope, education, and action, unquote. There are also after-school uh, reading programs during the regular school year and partnerships are formed between local community groups and the Children's Defense Fund to support these freedom schools. The, the Children's Defense Fund reports that since 1995, 70,000 children and their families have been involved in their program, 7,000 students, one, and uh, 1,500 adults have been trained and worked in these freedom school programs, and just in, the, in, the in 2009, the Children's Defense Fund reported that they had, um, they served 8,500 students, worked with 970 student uh, leader interns at 134 sites involving 90, 99 organizations in 79 cities and 27 states. Okay, so, so, so Freedom Schooling Programs is associated today because that program still exists with the Children's Defense Fund. With regard to the magnet schools since that time, we, because uh, so, remember, we're dealing with 30 years, and so now there have been all of these, there's all this data that has been accumulated on the success or effectiveness of the magnet schools. And so there was a recent study published in the uh, magazine The Nation in June in June of 2010, that was a survey of the magnet schools. 
And they said that the, and the author is Susan Eaton, and she's, uh, she's at Harvard at the Charles Hamilton Houston Research Center at Harvard Law School. And she did this survey, and she said that over the last several decades, the real track record of success lies with the magnet schools. Remember, remember we said that the magnet schools, we were calling it forth in 1978. This is 2010. And she says the real track record of success is found with the magnet schools. This is 2010. In states where comparisons were made in the academic achievement levels of black and white, magnet and non-magnet students, researchers found that African-American and Latino students, quote, made greater gains in math and reading than did their fellow students who stayed in the traditional urban school, unquote. And the white students attending the magnet schools, quote, outdid their peers at traditional suburban and generally much whiter schools, too. The so-called achievement gap between white students and students of co color tended to be smaller or non-existent in the magnet schools when compared to traditional urban public schools in these states." Unquote. That's today. Okay? Other articles have appeared recently about the success of students enrolled in magnet schools. They refer to it as, and, 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 and keep in mind, if you look at the references, the sheet with the references that I've handed out, I give you the references for these various articles. And it's on the table if you don't have a copy of it. I have each of these references I, are on the sheet there. So if you want to look up any of it. For example, the, the article called The Overlooked Model and The Forgotten Choice. The magnet schools are the forgotten choice in American education. Okay, at this point, you might be thinking, oh, the magnets are just like the charter schools and that they are based on choice. Students voluntarily choose to go to a charter school, and the magnets, but the magnet schools were created to promote voluntary school desegregation, but the charter schools are not. Right? But there are significant differences between the magnet schools and the charter schools. Whereas the charter schools get their certification for the, from the state, and they can be operated by universities, nonprofit foundations, private corporations, educational entrepreneurs. The magnet schools operate within the public school systems. They operate within the public school systems and they are organized by teachers in the urban public school T systems who have specific expertise in foreign languages or health careers or performing arts or engineering and other areas. In other words, it is the trained and experienced and unionized public school educators who come together to create the magnet schools. And the magnet school students' academic achievement levels are generally higher than those of the students in the traditional public schools, but the magnet school, but they also learn these other areas. They learn, they, they learn the specific field of knowledge, et cetera, that is specialized in the magnet schools. Now, um, <clears throat> Dr. Slaughter Defoe and co colleagues, we went to the movies last night. And we saw, <laughs> and we saw Waiting for Superman. And there is a, there's a decided bias in the movie Waiting for Superman against the, against the unions, against the teachers' unions, and against teachers in the public schools in general. And, at the, and, and then the film also spotlights these charter schools and, it, you know, and says, oh, yeah, this Kip school, this is wonderful, and this Harlem success, and the Harlem school zone, and the Kip schools, and they point out, and they have specialized on all of these. And at only one point in the film do they mention the magnet schools, because they're spending all this time condemning the teachers and in, in, in condemning the, the teachers' union, but it is the teachers 
in the teachers union, in the regular public schools who created the magnet schools who had the same level of success that they're pointing out in these charter schools, which may not be having that much success. And when you see the film, you will notice that there's only one mention of magnet schools in the film. There's all of this, all of this praise for the charter, these specific charter schools that they highlight, but, oh, but, the, but, but the question I asked Dr. Slaughter Defoe last night, I said, but if the teach, regular teachers in the public schools were given all the same resources, they would be able to create the same kinds of schools as these charter schools that they highlighted. So that there was no need to be condemning the unions and condemning the, te condemning the teachers in the public schools because they demonstrated that they could create excellent uh, schools with high levels of achievement because they've been doing it for 30 years in the magnet schools. <laughs> so, so, this was so, so when you see, if you decide you want to see Waiting for Superman, you'll see that there's, no, there's, there, there's this condemnation of the teachers and the teachers' union not realizing that the same kinds of success have been produced by, by regular urban public schools teachers in the magnet schools over the last 30 years. The, um, <clears throat> the charter schools, however, are different in, in several other ways. Um, the charter schools come out of, um, of this imposition of this business model on the running of the public schools. And so teachers then are, are judged as effective or ineffective, successful or unsuccessful on the basis of their work with the student, okay? And under this business model, success or failure of the teachers and the students is measured based on the student's performance in standardized tests, usually only in math and reading. Beginning in the 1990s in Texas under Governor George W. Bush, they introduced this business model that came to be known as the accountability system and the students were, te were to be tested on reading and math annually, and teachers and sc schools would be evaluated as success successful or failing based on the performance on the students' performance on these standardized tests. And then, as you know, the, with the, the creation of the accountability system and the utilization of standardized test results became a requirement for school districts seeking funds through No Child Left Behind. And you probably also know that there was usually not enough funds included in No Child Left Behind to improve the performance of students in so-called failing schools, nor were there places in, success, places in successful schools for students wishing to transfer out of the failing school to a successful school. But we all know that. <laughs> That's that story. But, okay, now this is interesting. What happened to a magnet school when the Texas accountability system was imposed on the magnet school. Okay, now remember that magnet schools has this success and the student, they, they have the specific areas and all of this, but now you have this accountability system where they have to be tested annually in reading and math and the teachers have to spend all this time preparing the students for this. Remember, they were doing art and music and agriculture and engineering and technology, now they, that now they have to be uh, subject to the accountability system. And what happened? Well we, well, we have a study. We have a very detailed study that came out of Texas, uh, Houston, Texas, on what happened to magnet schools in Houston, Texas, when the accountability system was imposed upon them. The, the study is by, and this is on your, on your sheet, the study is by Linda McNeil and it's called Contradictions of School Reform, the Educational Costs of Standardized Testing. And she reports the results of her case study of, of minority and majority students in three magnet schools in Houston, the Pathfinder School, the School for Science, Technology, and Engineering, and the Magnet School for Health Careers, okay? 
And she described what happened, and, this, and you can get this book, and so I have it on the list, I suggest you read it. She described what happened when the state accountability system was imposed on these very successful magnet schools in Houston. She, McNeil, uh, she said that um, <clears throat> the magnet schools previously, the ed, uh, uh, the, in the magnet schools, the educational value of the students' knowledge was important in the classroom. But the students' knowledge, the students, what the students brought to the classroom, their own knowledge was really important in these magnet schools. However, quote, the ways that the standardized controls directly and negatively impacted the teaching, the curriculum, and the role of students in these magnet schools. And I'm going to quote, the accountability systems <clears throat> are traced their or origins to the business leadership outside the schools through political trade-offs with the governor and the legislature, George Bush, that silenced educators and forced them to accept a highly complex system of controls over their work in exchange for even very modest pay increases. This analysis then tracks the bureaucratic implementation of these controls into instruments of accountability to measure the teacher's classroom practices and the outcomes of children's learning. The systemic analysis from corporate pressure to the legislature, to school bureaucracy, to the classroom, sheds new light on the harmful effects of policies that on the surface appear to be benign attempts to monitor edu educational quality and to assure schools are run in a cost-effective manner. In reality, these policies of standardization are de decreasing the quality of the teaching and the learning in our schools, especially in schools for poor and minority students." Unquote. The fact that there were costs to input the cost, that's the title of the book, the cost, that were associated with the imposition of these high stakes testing on the magnet schools. The problem is, is that we, that this study of the impact of those, that this accountability system on these magnet schools in Texas was published before No Child Left Behind was introduced. That is, we had information about the negative, potentially negative impact that the imposition of, these stand, of this high stakes testing on the high quality of education available in magnet schools, we knew about that before No Child Left Behind was, was put into place. The, to, for, as far as I'm, the, uh, eight years later, eight years later, after No Child Left Behind, we are now faced with a dropout crisis in urban public education. And this means that as a result of this situation, we, have, we are dealing with severe cases of educational malfeasance. And I have written about educational malfeasance and the need for reparations for educational malfeasance for many years as a result. The, and, and, and what I have been writing about and arguing is that in the face of this educational malfeasance, and the malfeasance comes in the form of the dropout crisis. We have an increase in the number of students dropping out as a result of the imposition of the accountability system and the standardized testing in these public schools. The accountability, system, the accountability system is having a direct effect, a direct effect. The imposition of these standardized high stakes testing is having a direct effect on the students and pushing the students out of these schools. And we have a study, we have a recent study of this in Texas uh, by the spot that was conducted by the Center for Education at Rice University in Houston. 
They looked at this issue. Quote, this is the Center of Education, and I have that cited in there too, the Center for Education at Rice University in Texas. Quote, the Texas accountability system contributes directly to the low graduation, graduation rates. Each year since 2000, Texas public high schools lost at least 135,000 youths prior to graduation. A disproportionate number of these are African American, Latino, and English language learners. This has serious implication for the nation's schools under the federal No Child Left Behind law, which has modeled after the Texas accountability system. By analyzing data from more than 271,000 students in a large urban school district, this study found that 60% of the African American students 75% of the Latino students and 80% of the English, uh, English as a second language students did not graduate within five years. The re researchers, now here's the key, this is from 2008, this was published in 2008. The researchers found overall a graduation rate of 33%. The study shows that as schools came under the accountability system, which uses test scores to rate schools and reward or discipline principals and teachers, large numbers of students left the system. The exit of low achieving students created the appearance of test scores, uh, appearance of test, rising test scores and of narrowing the achievement gap between white and, and minority students, thus increasing schools' ratings." Unquote. This was 2008 in Texas. Not only did these, teacher, did these researchers find that there was a systematic retention of up to 30% of the ninth grade students who perform poorly on state tests, 30% of the ninth grade students in Texas, in Texas being held back a year. The, they found the degradation of the, of the curriculum into drills for tests and the imposition of the zero tolerance rules for attendance and behavior which has had the effect of pushing more and more young people out of the public schools and into the criminal justice system. So in other words, they're spending all this time on test prep in the public school. The recent study, this is 2009, completed by Northwestern, Northeastern University Center for Later, Labor Studies, found that one in 10 one in 10 young male high school dropouts, one out of every 10, is in jail or in, de in detention on any given day. The figure for African American male dropouts, one in four. The statistics presented demonstrate clearly that there is a public school to prison pipeline in operation. And this reality should serve as the basis for reparations lawsuits. The public school to prison pipeline is the basis for reparations lawsuits. Okay? Mark Mariel, the president of the National Urban League, pointed out, quote, the dropout rate is driving the nation's increasing prison population. It is a drag on America's economic competitiveness, unquote. With regard to unemployment, in 2008, it was reported that 54% of dropouts aged 16 to 24 were jobless, compared with 32% of high school graduates of the same age, and only 13% of those with a college degree. 
the unemployment rate for young African American dropouts is 69% compared to 54% for white dropouts. The report also noted that, quote, young female dropouts were, young female dropouts were nine times as like, more likely to be single mothers than young women who went on to earn college degrees, unquote. The testing regime is causing great harm because it is pushing students out of the schools, out of schools around the country given this preoccupation with test prep, with test preparation. Once children drop out of school and fall, they fall into the hands of the criminal justice system in too many instances. Then they become victims of what I term and what others have termed predator capitalism. Predator capitalism, like other poor people throughout the country. And the predator capitalists are alive and well in the private prison industry. Predator capitalists in the private prison industry. Now, some of you have heard of disaster capitalism. You know, disaster capitalists where people make, these capitalists, they make money off wars. And they make money off of disasters, et cetera. Naomi Klein's famous book is, is, is on disaster capitalism. Well, now we have predator capitalism. And these are so-called entrepreneurs who prey on the poor and the working class and use their wealth and their political influence through lobbying and, and campaign contributions to engage in extortionate mortgage refinancing schemes, payday loans, instant tax returns, and other vehicles to get money out of the poor and the working class. I recommend to you the new book by Gary Revlin called, and I brought it, Broke USA, From Pawn Shops to Poverty Incorporated, How the Working Poor Became Big Business. And Revlin noted that, quote, predator capitalists include major corporations and banks, chain franchises, and newly hatched enterprises that fleece the country's hardworking waitresses, warehouse workers, and mail clerks, unquote. Subprime lending practices did not begin with the housing boom in 2000 in the, in, the, in, the, in the 20th century. They go back to the credit card industry, which began to charge 18 and 20 percent, 18 to 25 percent annual percentage rates in the 1970s. But then in the 1980s, you had the subprime home equity loans in the 1980s and 1990s that targeted the poor, that targeted working class people, that targeted African Americans. And, they, and, and these predator, predatory subprime lending practices and you, were carried out by these, these new financial institutions that were bankrolled by the regular banks. So you had so some beneficial finance. The money store, household finance, fleece, fleet finance, and remember Champion? When a bank won't give you money in, Champion will, and they will gouge you to death, and they will take your money, and they will take your house if you don't watch it. You should, no, there are all of these instances of people who, look, I mean, the, the story's in there, so, I'm, so they give you the examples of people and, and, with, and the way that this targeting worked is that they would, they would have these brokers, they would go around in the neighborhood. Now, this is all before 2000. This is not the recent subprime. I'm talking about this is 1980s, 1990s. They would go around, these brokers would go around the neighborhoods, black neighborhoods, where black people own their homes. And they would go into these neighborhoods and they would see a house that needed repair. 
And they would go and they would knock on the door and the little, and, you know, and the woman, she said, oh, she said, oh yeah, I've been wanting to do this. They said, oh yeah, well, you, you know, and he said, oh, I don't have any. He said, oh, I can get a load for you just real quick by tomorrow. You just fill this out. And the per and they would fill out the, they would take out this loan and it would be one of these subprime loans and in broke USA, and these are, I mean, and these stories are heart-wrenching because these black older black people who own their homes, many of them lost their homes by taking out a loan for a house repair in the 1990s. The loan would start out, they would get a loan for $5,000, they fall behind in the payment, and then they would have all these penalties. So you had people that where they started out with a loan for, for, for $5,000, and they would end up owing uh, Fleet Finance or Champion $63,000, and they would take their home. This was before the subprime move to new housing. This was for refinancing. And so we, so, so, and so the, so we, we, unfortunately, we also have these predator capitalists operating in the private prison industry. And they are high, they are well connected, and despite the harm that racially disproportionate sentencing practices and mandatory sentencing causes, children of color are continually being victimized. In preparing reparation suits, we will not only document the reasons why these children drop out or are pushed out of urban public school, but we will call attention to those who pushed them out and how they were pushed out and those who benefited from these policies and practices, especially the corporate, en corporate entities uh, that uh, dominate the private prison industry. But I'm getting to the testing people in a moment. <laughs> the conditions that currently exist for our youth are completely intolerable. And concerned educators and parents need to bring reparation suits for educational malfeasance that created this situation and against those who have benefited from the construction of the, prison, of the public school to prison pipeline. And what are we going to do with those reparation suits? When you, when you, when you have these, these suits against these, uh, these uh, private prisons, we use the money to open freedom schools. We use the money for reparation suits to open freedom schools. Not money going to individuals. They go in just like, just like we had in Louisiana with the, with the escrow fund and all that. You create an escrow fund and then you you, then you, you apply to get money to open up a freedom school out of escrow funds that was where the money has been deposited as a result of successful reparation suits. Okay, so you apply to, get open, to, to open a freedom school. Now you may be thinking that the charter schools could become freedom schools. Charter schools, perhaps they could become freedom schools. Indeed, as part of the charter school revolution, you had the opening of schools that specialized in the hospitality industry, the sports and business, peace and social justice, architecture, health careers, etc. However, the charter school movement was promoted by right-wing politicians and their and foundations and wealthy corporate capitalists, as Diane Ravitch calls it, the, the Billionaire Boys Club, Sam Walton, Eli Broad, Bill and Melinda Gates, the philanthro capitalists. And they were interested in things that they can measure. That's why they were interested in the test, in the standardized test, you know, because they say, we want measurable results. And they use their money to influence what goes on in the public school. However, regardless of the specialized subjects in the charter schools, they must make sure that the educational program conforms to the accountability system. That is, that charter schools have to conform to the accountability system. And the imposition of the standardized, test, the standardized testing regime determines classroom, classroom activity, not just in the public schools, but also determines the script that is followed in many of what are considered successful charter schools. 
The teachers in traditional public schools are forced to spend increasing amounts of time preparing students to take standardized tests and less time on those activities that the teachers believe would benefit the children under their instruction. In many charter schools, the teachers are given a script. In the charter schools, the teachers are given a script to follow to prepare the students for test. Not a curriculum, a script to follow in order to prepare the students for standardized tests. Diane Ravitch in her mea culpa. <laughs> that, that, that was published. Uh, they, you know, Diane Ravitch was one of the people who helped finance the, this, the charter school uh, uh, revolution. And her mea culpa, she provides an insider's view of how the business model was imposed on the deliverance of educational services and how educational entrepreneurship would be promoted. The book is The Death and Life of Great American School System, How Testing and Choice Are Undermining Education. Ravage mentioned visiting charter schools, and she asked the charter school operators to see the curriculum. And the teachers told her, oh, well, we have a script. <coughs> we don't have a curriculum. We have a script. <laughs> and the lessons, these lessons were scripted to correspond to the likely questions that would be asked on the standardized test. And now I got a personal story here. <laughs> I go to church in New Orleans. I one of the friend of mine in the church, you know, I, you know, we had a, over the dinner. He is a teacher in the public schools in New Orleans, but not in the regular public schools. He's a teacher in an Edison school. We know about those in Philadelphia. He's a teacher in an Edison school. I've not visited these charter schools, but this, this friend of mine, he's a teacher in the Edison school. We had dinner, we had, I said, oh, I, see, I don't hear very good things about the, about the charter schools, about that. No, no, they're not good. He's a teacher in the school. I said, yes, and I, told, and I was told that they don't really have a curriculum, all they have is a script. Yeah, that's the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I don't do that. Yeah, I give the children more. But I said, but the rest of the teachers, they go by a script, right? They don't have a curriculum. Yeah, they have a script. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Ravage points out, for example, that the Knowledge for Power program, or the KIPP schools, and you're going to get the KIPP schools and waiting for, or waiting for Superman, which are considered the most successful of these, uh, most successful of these charter schools, the KIPP schools, because they're the most successful, there are 82 of them around the country. Now, what are the characteristics of the, char the KIPP charter school? These are the, this is the best. This is considered the best. Oh, the students wear uniforms. They have strict disciplinary rules. They spend 60% more time in school. And students, parents, teachers sign a contract agreeing to fulfill specific responsibilities. While the standardized test scores are higher at, for KIPP students than children in neighborhood, uh, in, uh, children from their neighborhood enrolled in traditional public schools, and this is what you get in waiting for Superman. This is what you get, you get this KIPP school and they how they split. Okay, they are more effective than the traditional public schools they're not as effective as their original model. And their original model was the urban Catholic schools. That was the original model. That's the model for these KIPs. Strict discipline. Parents have to have a buy-in. You have to wear uniforms. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, I mean the, 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 the KIPP school, the, we, we know that format because that was the format of the, of, of the urban Catholic schools. And I know this because I went to an urban Catholic school here in Philadelphia. I went to most precious blood of our Lord Parish School in North Philadelphia. <laughs> and we wore uniforms, <laughs> we had strict discipline. My parents had to, not only did they have to sign a contract and make sure that they showed up at the school, my, my, they had to get remarried <laughs> in the Catholic church, you know, <laughs> in order for us, to, for us to attend the Catholic school. And they were, and, 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 and so, it's, but the difference is, is that we didn't just learn math and reading, 
We didn't just learn math and reading, which is all you get in the KIPP schools. We had history, geography, religion, civics, mathematics, uh, religion. We had, we had eight or nine different subjects that we, that we uh, were tested on biannually in the diocesan examinations. And so we had the diocesan. So, so the KIPP school, by being geared toward these standardized tests, is a narrow. It's, it's modeled after the urban Catholic school. But, the, but it's much more narrow than what the, act, the urban Catholic schools actually uh, provided. <clears throat> but the, <clears throat> the uh, and, and so you'll get this, this, uh, these, uh, this KIPP school if you go see Waiting for Superman. And, and, and they really gloss over the fact that they say, yes, and we know that only one out of every five of the charter schools are successful. They, grow, they say that, they say that, they, they run fast, they, they say that very quick. You know, we, know, we know that only one out of five does any better than a traditional public school. <laughs> they say that in the film. <clears throat> Diane Rabbits uh, noted that some charters had efficient management teams that ran first-rate schools, but others were operated by minimally competent providers who collected money while offering bare-bones education to gullible students. And a few were opened by get-rich schemers out to seek who saw easy pickings, unquote. A recent article in New York Times discussed the vultures, these educational entrepreneurs that are circling around these new billions of dollars that they're giving to the Department of Education that's going to be given out of, you know, uh, sometime soon. And these, uh, and these educational entrepreneurs, just keep in mind that they, don't, they do not necessarily have to know anything about education. Despite, and so, <clears throat> and so what you have this no child left behind, this business model, this accountability systems, this has all contributed to the Halliburtonization, the Halliburtonization of American education. Educational entrepreneurs enter competition for contracts from state departments of education, just like military contractors compete for defense contracts. And despite the exorbitant charges, the regular cost overruns, the unsatisfactory performance and the deliverance of, deliverance of, of goods and services, Halliburton and the other military contractors continue to receive military contracts and getting billions of dollars of taxpayer money. The new educational entrepreneurs, they want to get the billions that have been recently appropriated for the Department of Education. The testing, the testing industry engages in the same lobbying efforts in state capitals in Washington, D.C., as does Halliburton and the, rep as, and, and the representatives of the private prison industry. And in a sad and unfortunate way, the testing industry and the private prison industry are linked and that those who are deprived of educational resources and opportunities and, the, and this is based on standardized test performance, significantly increases their likelihood of spending time in prison, <coughs> leading to this public school to prison pipeline. And over the years, the operation of this pipeline has harmed disproportionately children of color enrolled in the public school. The testing industry needs to be sued for reparations on the basis of the past harm and current damage they are inflicting on children of color. The educational testing service, the college board, and the corporate testers harm our have harmed our children in the past by the claims that they made about what standardized tests are measuring. I've published studies of the history of the, of the standardized testing movement in the United States and its impact on African-American children. From the beginning, the tests were culturally biased based and, uh, because they were tests that were developed to measure white Anglo-Saxon Protestant cultural and intellectual superiority and the superiority of those who adopt white Anglo-Saxon Protestant beliefs, values, and practices. Almost from the beginning, intelligence or aptitude tests were also used to rationalize the widely varying distribution of resources to children in public schools. 
the unequal distribution of educational resources was based on white supremacist policies and beliefs, but they were backed up by test results. Black social scientists conducted study after study to demonstrate that when African American children or other children of color were provided the same resources and made familiar with the material on the standardized tests, they did as well as white Anglo-Saxon children. In response, the heads of the various testing services claimed that the tests were measuring innate ability and coaching or compensatory educational programs could only lead to modest uh, performance or modest improvement because the tests were actually measuring how much a child was capable of learning at a given age. They came out and they, made, they kept making this statement. The stories of the harm that the use and misuse of standardized testing has done to children and adults throughout the 20th century are legendary in family and school lore. But the testing industry maintained and benefited from, maintained these claims and benefited from these claims. In his autobiography, Test Pilot, How I Broke testing barriers for millions of students and caused a sonic boom in the, test, in the business of education, Stanley Kaplan, Stanley Kaplan, <laughs> explained how not only did the educational testing service and the college board distribute handbooks that stated that coaching and test prep was a waste of time and a waste of money, but they also implied that if there were improvements in test results on the SAT tests or these various other tests, it was probably due to cheating. The testers wanted to protect their interests, and, they, and in, so these were in the handbooks, in the handbooks that they would send out with the test. And then the, the college board and, it, and ETS sick the federal, the federal Trade Commission on Stanley Kaplan. They went and filed a claim against Stanley Kaplan. And they said that, oh, he, that they, and they said test preparation for, the, for SAT caused education to be, and I'm quoting from the Educational Testing Service, unwillingly corrupted in some schools to get to gain ends which we believe to be not only unworthy, but are ironically unattainable, unquote. The College Board accused, got the Federal Trade Commission to accuse Stanley Kaplan of false advertising and deceptive marketing practices that violate fair federal, uh, uh, that violate federal trade practices. So they came after Stanley Kaplan in 19, as a result of the College Board and others, they came after Stanley Kaplan and the Federal Trade Commission investigated him in several times, and, uh, and as the title of his autobiography demonstrates, he won. He won. That coaching, that compensatory, so, and you got Stanley Kaplan right across the street here. So, so, so clearly, clearly he won. But the testing, the testing industry had been saying all the way up through the late 1970s that coaching and compensatory education would have no effect, would have no effect on improving test scores. And, and the tracking, <clears throat> but, what the, but what about the harm? What about the harm that had been done to children of color, particularly African-American children, who on the basis of their performance on tests were told that they should not reach for something that was what? Unattainable. The tracking that was put in place in many school districts was driven by students' performance on standardized tests. Test results were used to segregate African-American and Mexican-American children in public schools in the North, the West, and the Southwest throughout most of the 20th century. And those separate schools were deprived of educational resources because the test results supposedly proved that it would be a waste of taxpayer money to provide funding in these all-black or all-Mexican schools equal to that provided in schools for white children. 
That's why I would call on concerned parents, teachers, and unions, teachers' unions, and educators to pursue litigation against the testing industry, which needs to make restitution for the harm that its tests have been causing over all of these years. And the funds obtained from these from this litigation should then be used, made available to school districts willing to open freedom schools. And in the freedom schools would be different from the charter schools because in the freedom schools there would be no standardized testing. In the freedom schools there would be no, that's how you would do it. With charter schools test, standardized test, the freedom schools, no standardized testing. The teachers in the freedom schools would be, would approach education through mastery learning. Remember mastery learning where everybody passes and stuff under Benjamin Bloom in the University of Chicago? I studied with uh, Bloom in the University of Chicago and, and, we, uh, and we were introduced to mastery learning where there's no bell curve, where each child is expected to, expected to master the material in the curriculum. I, 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 I was struck by that. I learned that at the University of Chicago in the 1970s, and over the uh, last 35 years of teaching, history mostly, but also education, I can, I can say I have never given a student a standardized test or a multiple choice test. And, and I think that I'm a pretty good teacher, but I've never, and then when I mention it to other people, they say, oh yeah, I never gave one of those tests. All right, all right, so now the only measure of a good teacher is a teacher whose students do well on the standardized test. And what I'm saying is, is that I never gave a student a standardized or a multiple choice test. So therefore, I can't be a good teacher. <laughs> all, right. all right, and so the freedom schools would be about mastery learning. Students would master a body of knowledge, would master, master a field of study, and the teachers would evaluate them. They would set up an accountability system that, that they, then evaluate the, sisters, the students on the basis of their mastery of, of this material. If they want to use standardized tests, that would be, that, that's fine. But all I'm saying is, is that it should be up to the teachers in the freedom schools to, uh, to uh, determine whether or not they want to use this, but mastery learning. So you say, you leave here, you say, oh, we heard about freedom schools, and he was talking about these freedom schools, and he said these freedom schools would have what? No standardized testing, that, they, that, the, that the students would be uh, interested in achieving mastery of particular areas. That would be the distinct, distinguishing characteristic. Freedom schools in the arts, in the, in the Music, science, technology, health care, community, uh, de community development would provide an alternative to the traditional uh, public schools and would be open um, by educated, committed, uh, committed uh, educators committed to engaging children, students in the mastery of particular bodies of knowledge and sets of skills. And, and how am I recommending that the educators and the school district officials obtain funds for these freedom schools? bring lawsuits for reparations against the pri private prison industry, against ETS, against the College Board, and these various other uh, testing agencies. And I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, you say, oh boy, he, this, he doesn't know what he, he is just out the wall. He's just, oh, he don't know what he's talking about. Well, there's another film <laughs> that I recommend to you. This film, so you could, and it's probably not available in that, but when it comes out, you, you make a beeline to go to see it. The film is called Cleveland versus Wall Street. Cleveland versus Wall Street, and it's by a French director. And in that film, you have the actual officials in Cleveland and the people who lost their homes as a result of the subprime debacle in the 19, in 2000. These people sued Wall's 21 banks 21 banks and mortgage, Bank of America, Bear Stirb, Ameri AmeriQuest Mortgage, Morg uh, Merrill Lynch. They sued the city of Cleveland, sued these 21 banks to get reparations for the damage that the, that the foreclosure crisis that was created by Wall Street, the damage and harm that it did to the city of Cleveland. 
the film that is a documentary film and the actual people who participated in that trial, in the original trial, are in the film. Okay, so, it was, so this was a class action suit. So Wall Street, the testing industry, you see, you see, you know, this was a class, this was, this was a, large, a large suit. And, and, um, the, and, and unfortunately, they lost. They, in, in, they, they, they lost the case, they, had, they needed to get uh, six out of eight jurors, and they were only get, able to get five, et cetera. But they, they, they appealed the case, and it went to the US Court of Appeals. And on July 27th, 2010, the US, the Sixth District U.S. Court of Appeals uh, ruled against the city of Cleveland. Now, if I were a politician in the city of Cleveland, I would, I would know how I would go back to, the, to there and begin to protest the demonstrations, the picketing of, of these various agencies, because that's the only way that the situation is going to change. Because we need, because we have to, we have to, you have to keep in mind there's going to be no, they said there's going to be no socialism. <laughs> no socialism, that's a dirty word. But the situation for most of us is getting worse. The wealth is being moved more and more to, to the wealthy class. How are you going to redistribute, begin to redistribute this wealth that was, that was obtained through predatory capitalist practices by these various wealthy classes. We've got to figure out ways to attack them. One of the ways that they have started is to attack them is to bring these reparation suits against these agencies that caused all of this harm. And, in, and the testing industry and the prison industry that has caused all this harm to our children, we need to bring reparation suits against those industries. And why do we have to do that? Because we want freedom schooling. And when do we want freedom schooling? We want it now. Thank you. Handle the Q and A, or because uh, we're. <laughs> I think uh, we'll just. Uh, we don't have much time. We'll have a couple of uh, questions, uh, comments, whatever. You can handle the Q and A. <laughs> Being pushed out of the school, they're being forced out of the school by, by this 
emphasis on test prep. And since there's no, there doesn't seem to be any kind of, 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 of sympathetic ear in terms of the, in terms of federal government, in terms of to, well, what about alternatives to this? Alternative to the standardized testing? What about what about nationally learning? What about you know? What about these alternatives that exist? They aren't interested. What about the magnet schools as a model? The magnet schools exist. I mean, they've existed for 30 years. They're a model. They're an alternative model. Why don't you put some funding into that? They won't. And so we have to figure out other ways to draw attention, to get people interested in uh, trying to figure out how they can raise some kinds of funds in order to provide these alternatives to what is being pushed on us, being forced on us uh, through this, this accountability system and this emphasis on high stakes testing. Yeah. Uh, okay. You know, are there any attempts with the mastery learning to use the technology in a blended learning environment to leverage the process? In other words, have more people get access to it online with the younger children, especially the ones that are technically savvy? Yeah, well, well, I mean, we have all kinds of what they call uh, cyber schools and cyber networks, et cetera, that are created for, uh, for educational purposes. But, and, 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 and some of them have been funded through, the, through charter school funds. I mean, in Pennsylvania, for example, they have these cyber schools and, you know, where these charter school operators are getting money as, uh, to, uh, to supposedly educate these children through online learning, et cetera. And I, and, and I think that that is um, a way for these educational entrepreneurs to get money. I don't know how, <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know how well the students are learning you know, on these techniques. It's sort of like uh, this is what you get. I don't know whether that. There's another documentary that was on PBS that I recommend to you uh, called College Inc., which is about the online college systems. It's called College Inc. and it was on PBS a little while ago, and you can get it and stuff. And it's about the online learning uh, system. And basically, these educational entrepreneurs they buy a college and set up this online university, uh, put these courses on, get the students to get loans from the federal government. And remember, the federal government says that these online universities can only get up to 80% of their funding from the federal government. So they get the students to get loans up to, and get so that it's up to 80% of their income coming from the federal government through the federal student loan programs. And these students then um, pay this money to these online universities and really basically self-taught, <laughs> basically self-taught in, in these programs. Because no teacher, you know, like, oh, you finished this number, now move on to the next one. Oh, you finished that, oh, no, go back to this, oh, go. You know, so there's, it's, it's almost like self-taught. These, and, and these uh, online universities uh, uh, get these students to get these loans, they get into terrible debt. It costs more to go to the University of Phoenix than the University of California. <laughs> paid $30,000 a year for the courses in nursing. And they said, and they interviewed these people in the documentary, and they say, hey, uh, didn't you think it was kind of strange that you would get this degree in nursing and you didn't go anywhere near a hospital? And they said, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then they said that I'm upset, and now they're upset because they paid all this money and nobody will hire them. Okay, and so, and so all I'm saying is, is that, that, the, that, the, uh, that the technology is available to uh, assist these educators, to improve the students' education, but we can't depend on that for, all, for various areas that I'm hoping that the students will be pursuing in these freedom schools. Uh, we'll take one more question and then uh, I think we'll have... Okay, we can talk. I see one more, yeah, one, we can one, talk one more question. I get yeah, I, thank you, Dr. Franklin. I, I just want to push back a little bit. Two things. One is, I went to a magnet school. I didn't grow up here in Philadelphia, but I grew up in Detroit. 
um, has its own share of issues. Um, but I grew up in Detroit, and I went to a magnet school, and it was notorious for tracking students. So out of the 600 people that graduated from my high school class, Maybe what was I heard school. What was it supposed to be? What type well, it didn't have a, a specialty. Oh, as you, the, the kind of what you alluded to. It didn't have it didn't have one specialty, but it tracked kids. Mm -hmm. So you had people who studied fashion and design in the school. So all of that specialty was located in the school, but the school overall didn't have a special. It didn't have a focus. Special focus. Right. Um, thirty, maybe thirty of us got sort of the rigorous caliber of education that we got, such that I was able to matriculate here at Penn undergrad. So, I, magnet school, I, I worry about us sort of trying to find models instead of trying to sort of identify what makes a good school a good school. We're talking about school culture, mm -hmm. We're talking about attitudes and ethics and uh, standards of excellence, talking about community, senses of community within schools. These are things that aren't on the list of the, the profile for magnets or charters. I'm on the board of a charter school now, actually, mm -hmm. and it was started by teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I understand what you mean when you talk about Edison and stuff, but, you know, the, the model can't be our salvation. Um, could you just kind of address what of the magnet schools that aren't sort of doing what you suggest? Right, well, yeah, the thing is just that the magnet schools, remember the, the magnet schools that I'm talking about and the magnet schools that are, that are the, considered the models do have a specialization. They, the reason, they, the, the, that is, for example, in your school, were you able to attract white students? to attend the school if it didn't have any kind of specialized curriculum. See, see, that was the purpose of the magnet school, was to try to attract white students for desegregation purposes. And so therefore, it was, the purpose was to attract white students. Did it serve that purpose? No. I, mean, I, don't, think it, I don't think it ever uh, and, and that, And yeah. probably the reason why it did was because of the traffic. Because of the of the lack of a well, of habitus Detroit of, is something of, like culture is black. I mean, I, you know, I, I hear you. Yeah. I think the demographic of the city means that you don't have any school that has any sort of diversity at all. In right, and so therefore, <laughs> and that is the reason why I'm saying they should change that kind of school into a freedom school where it would have a specific, where it would have a specific emphasis of, the, of the, a specific area, and wouldn't have this tracking because all of the students would be doing arts. Science, music, agriculture, etc. So, 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 the, so the, the I agree with you fully about the culture at the school, but one of the but but the culture of the school is created by the students and the teachers who want to be there. By the students and the teachers who want to be there in that place, and so therefore, because they want to be there, they police the environment. They want, the children want to be there, the teachers want to be there, they're happy about what's going on in the school, they protect the environment. I've been in those schools, and I've been in those kinds of schools in Philadelphia. And so, and, and so, so that, you know, so, so the, the model that I'm suggesting is to create, is a model that would create the kind of culture in the school where the students and the teachers want to be there, love being there, they protect the environment. You don't need all of this security and all of this because the students want to be there. Okay? 